Hi, and welcome to the Intentional Wealth Update from Morton Brown Family Wealth. I'm Dennis Morton here with Katie Brown. Good morning, Katie. Good morning. Today, we're going to talk about retirement spending and the habits that people have and develop with their spending as they work their way through retirement. We have two articles that we're going to spotlight today. The first is from a blog called Of Dollars and Data from Nick Majuli, where he talks about retirees and how they are not spending all that they're earning. Katie, this one really had an impact on you and the way you thought about it. You kind of came, had an emotional response to this article, right? I did. I did. You know, a lot of our planning work that we do with clients is, is figuring out, okay, what are the assets that have been accumulated? What are your expenses? How do those assets support you in achieving your goals, whatever that retirement date might look like, whatever the retirement might look like, and obviously taking into account outside income streams. But the, the thing that was interesting about the article is that it wasn't as much about how large is that pool of assets. It was about the income coming off of it and, and the spending habits of retirees more tied to the income piece, not the asset pool piece. They, they cited a research by New York Life where they said across all wealth levels, 58% of retirees are withdrawing less than their investments earn, 26% are withdrawing up to the amount that they earn, and 14, only 14% 14 are drawing down their principal. That, that, those are big numbers. That's a lot of flexibility. Those are big numbers. So that's six and seven retirees, six out of seven are not pulling from that principal balance. That piece that they've worked their entire careers to try to build up to. And there's almost a fear of like, I'm, I'm concerned about spending too much because what if something happens down the road or they've just built the habit and the muscle for the savings and watching that account go up, that it's very uncomfortable to, to even think about that balance coming down. And, right. and, and so that's, that's something else that the article highlighted is it's not as much about, will that asset pool support higher spending as it is about the psychological acceptance of seeing that asset pool come down, which I thought was an interesting outcome from from the studies that were done. Yeah. And in many ways, it's totally understandable that we have this reluctance as savers to do this. This generation of retirees is different from any generation that's come before. You know, they've been accumulating in 401ks for decades now, but they're one of the first generations to ever have a pool of assets. Their parents might have had a pension, maybe so, uh, definitely Social Security if they had a pension, some income stream that came in, but they weren't sitting on one or $2 million or a nest egg that they had to watch every day go up and down and then make decisions about how to spend that. It's the paycheck to savings leap is a big one and they don't want to minimize that. Mm -hmm. We have to give ourselves grace. This is a big departure. Right, right. And it, sometimes you hear the phrase new money, people that are new to having more money. And that's, I think, a lot about what this generation is in, in some way in that they might not have lived their life having that large asset pool there. As you mentioned, that's something that has accumulated over times. And in many cases, it's more than they expected to accumulate. You know, granted this year, we have a challenging market environment, but it's coming off of the tail of a decade of incredible market returns. And so those, those asset pools are larger and, and the dollars are bigger. We often talk about that with our clients. The dollar swings are going to be bigger as the asset pool gets larger. And that's, it's still a, a difficult thing to come to terms with, I think, if you're not used to watching those fluctuations over time. And it'd be one thing if we were in a 5% interest rate environment where you could earn money on CDs or checking accounts or other things like it was 15, 20 years ago, but that hasn't been the case. We've been coached into this low interest rate environment over time, which means that 4% rule that people use for retirement withdrawals. Much of that has been funded by stock market returns over the last 10 years, not bond market returns, not income streams. And again, people have much more comfort with, I'm receiving a paycheck or interest or something like that. It feels much less dependable to rely on the risk portion for that. And I would even say, I think in a lot of cases, people are spending less than that 4% mm -hmm. because they they are looking at, okay, what is the the interest or the dividends? And, and they might not put the capital appreciation into that. Like they look and say, okay, I, I earned you know, this much this month, this year, and they adjust their spending to that income level rather than 
in, in some cases, even just permissioning themselves to be able to take more of the money that they have accumulated and, and saved over time, they would rather adjust the, the spending than adjust the draw. And, and so that that's an interesting dynamic too, and kind of shifting shifting the mindset once again to how much income is coming from there versus how much money is in the bucket. Yes, yes. Another article that came out last week, the Wall Street Journal had a profile of what a $2 million retirement looks like. And they profiled four retirees at various stages. Some had been retired for more than a decade. Some had recently retired. Some had retired older, some younger. But they walked through just what it means to have enough in retirement, but still have concerns about your spending, your savings, the market, everything else. Katie, I thought this was an interesting profile for some of these retirees. The first thing that jumped out at me was they're all millionaires on paper from their savings perspective, but they had various different jobs. One had been a police officer, one had been in human resources, only one was a CEO or a top executive. But what did you think of these profiles of retirees and, their, and how they're thinking about their savings levels? One of the things that I really appreciated about it is that it went beyond just the spending and a little bit into kind of quality of life and what they're doing in their time. And so a couple of them are have essentially created like part-time to almost full-time jobs of volunteering or other paid positions or or even like board positions where maybe there's an income stream associated with it. All of them had kind of some diverse income streams for the most part, in addition to what they might be receiving from, from the portfolio. And, and so I, I appreciated them touching on the, the quality of life and how those retirees are finding fulfillment during retirement too, and how that's, that's different from person to person. Yes. Yes. I also thought it was interesting. Um, several of them had debt going into retirement. Um, you know, one had, I think, a four hundred thousand dollar mortgage. The other had an adjustable rate mortgage. And, and one explicitly said, "Don't go into retirement with debt because it's kind of hamstringing some of his decision making in doing so." But that that also comes down to he has assets. What was the spending plan related to debt? How could that have been maybe front loaded five ten years ago? to get into a better place now. I think there's, I think there's a planning opportunity there, right? Oh, I totally agree. Yes. Yeah. I think there are some planning opportunities and in a little bit of going through that discernment process to, to say, where do I want to be when I get to retirement? Mm -hmm. you know, how comfortable am I going to be holding debt? What do I think about it? How comfortable? And, and I love that they, they also highlighted charitable giving. And, right. and how that is a priority for at least a couple of these people that, that were noted. And it's, it's a large piece of, of their spending. And, and, and so, you know, once again, kind of going through that process to determine, and we have, we have a neat exercise um, called fiscaloscopy. And many of you listening to this might've done this before, but it goes through kind of your, your philosophies around debt, charitable giving, supporting, you know, adult children, spending, savings, all of those things and kind of how you think about it, but then also how comfortable you are. And so making sure that, that you, you front load a lot of that into the planning work before you get to the point, you know, in retirement, you say, oh, I wish I would have done that. And, and now you might have some limitations as far as addressing some of those items. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's a very good point. There are two people I wish could have talked in this or should talk. The first person profiled and the third person profile. The first was a, the police officer who retired three years ago, has a little bit of debt. He has two homes. He has a vacation home. He lives in an expensive place. He's thinking of moving to Florida. But one of his lines, he said, I see my money slipping away every day. And, you know, he had about 2 million saved or 1.8. It's down to 1.3. So he's seen, you know, probably has some good equity exposure there if he's down, if he's down that much. But the third person profiled was a woman who retired in 2005 and her investments she had a million dollars in retirement in 2005. She has 2 million now. And what was, what happened three years after she retired? The great financial crisis. The market crashed. And here she is 15 years late on the other side. Her money has doubled over that time with her taking distributions and withdrawals. And you want to kind of, that, for that person who feels like, oh my gosh, it's slipping away, it's slipping away. We don't know what the next 70 years are going to hold. We do know she went through a turbulent time back then has emerged on the other side pretty well. She also owned a beach home and everything else. I feel like those people need to have coffee yeah. and, and just, just say like, okay, 
how did you get through it? You know, what, what did you do differently? What are some of the things? Because we can't choose when those things happen, but he does have levers to pull. He could downsize and move to Florida. He could choose to adjust spending or everything else. And I think it's part of that. We need some reassurance that there's no right answer. We can't choose the timing, but other people have gone through this and succeeded. You know, and, and something that you just touched on there too, that I think is really important to highlight is be careful with the large decisions that you're making during periods like this, where you have significant market volatility, be careful in, in saying, all right, I'm going to make a significant change to my living arrangements. I'm, I'm going to sell this and move there because I, I need to cut my costs. There are some other things that, that, you know, look for other levels that levers that are a little more subtle and have some patience, give yourself some grace. It's always going to be a little bit of a, a rocky road when it comes to investing, because there's always going to be volatility, both to the downside and to the upside. And, and there are some things that you can benefit from, but be very careful about those really large financial moves during times like this. Very good point. We actually shared in our newsletter that went out last week, we had an article saying that of people who bought a house in 2021, I think, or something in the last 18 months, 70% regretted the decision because they made it too fast. You remember last year, the story was people are buying houses with cash, you know, uh, swooping in and trying to beat everyone up to the chase and, and no inspections, all that other stuff. A vast majority regretted that decision a year later. So that's a very good point. And just kind of that regret setting, think about what you think about in the future back into where you are now. Yeah. Yeah. We've even touched on, on, you know, kind of this saying before when everybody else is moving fast, look for opportunities to slow down. Like that's the time to move slow. And when people are moving slow, that might be your opportunity to move fast. This sounds like your strategy in a half marathon, Katie. Is this what you did? <laughs> when, when everyone else slows down, just kind of bolt ahead. I go slow with a mindset of, all right, eventually I'm going to speed up. And then it you're going to fool all these other people into your pace and then <laughs> got it. Okay. There, there's, there's a retirement analogy in there. So we'll, we'll, we'll get into <laughs> Katie's parallels between racing and, and financial planning later on. All right. Thank you for joining us. This retirement spending conversation is a dynamic one. It's challenging, but happy to share our wisdom with you and some experience we've had with clients. If you have questions or topics that you'd like us to speak about in the future, shoot us an email. Uh, always happy to have a conversation. So until next time, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.